Thank you, Steve. He does a wonderful job ministering to us in song. Failure. Have you ever been there? Have you ever failed at anything? There's times in our lives that the failures of our past have captivated us so much that we are felt inadequate to move into the future. But God uses those times within our life that we feel like that we have failed to bring to us a point within our life that we can have a purpose into the future. Failure. Now, you know, growing up many years ago, going through high school, I hated those six-week six report cards. Anybody else hate those things? Because I knew that my mom and dad was going to get a six-week report card, and I knew that if I had an incomplete or I had a, a grade out or if I had something going on and I had a D or an F, I was going to get in trouble. Report cards. And if I failed the class, I was really going to be in trouble. But the six-week report card, the midterm report card, did wonders for motivation. Amen? Because I, I have still time to turn this thing around so I can get at least a C and pass the class. I didn't want to fail. It was a motivator within our life. And it started all the way back when we were in school to get a grade for the work that we have done, and many of us have failed in classes. Now, many of you, and I'd say some of you, if you get a B, you feel like you have failed. If I ever got a B, I feel like I passed. It was awesome. I was very happy with a B. But it passed down into my family. I remember this one time, and I, I'm not supposed to tell personal family illustrations, but for this one time, I'm going to. My boy was playing basketball, and, and he was in algebra class, with his girlfriend and his girlfriend she got a's on everything so brett was one of those guys that he just wanted to pass the class he wanted to play basketball that next friday night so he thought you know what i am just going to sit beside ashley in this test and whatever she puts down on her test i'm going to put down on my test and so he passed everything in there were 20 questions and and he passed it in and all of a sudden the teacher called the coach and said uh your basketball player cheated on this test. And the coach says, no, Brett, he's a preacher's kid. He would never cheat. <laughs> and he said, will you prove to me that he cheated? He said, I will. Ashley, the smartest kid in the class, got A's on everything, except for on question number 10. She just put, I do not know. I do not know. And look at what Brett put down. I don't know either. Now, he failed. Now, that's all hypothetical. That didn't take place. But it fit into the sermon that failure sometimes cannot be fatal. It can be a point that we all make mistakes, we all get in trouble, but we cannot be handcuffed to our past. Now, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, Paul is giving us a great illustration of how when people would look at us, they would define us or they would define him at this point as a failure. Imagine he came into Thessalonica and he preached for three weeks, three Sundays, and the church grew for three Sundays. But after that third Sunday, there was a mob of people in town that absolutely hated him because they found out that the church before that he was a pastor at in Philippi he was beaten, he was thrown into prison, and he, he, was, he, was just, he was just not happy. And the Philippi, the people in Philippi just basically tried to stone him to kill him. And he left Philippi, he came to Thessalonica, and they found out about his past. And he was ran out of town. So he left that town, and he went to Athens. And when he left to go to Athens, they found out the mob followed him. So every place he went... He was ran out of town. Why? Because they were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and people didn't like it. It was the early church. The early church, very few believers. But at that time, there was a mob of people that would stand up for anybody that opposed Christ. Now, here's what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1-5. through 5. I'm going to be reading out the New Living Translation. You yourselves know, dear brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not a failure. You know how badly we have been treated in Philippi just before we came 
to you and how much suffering there. Yet our God gave us courage to declare his good news to you boldly, even though we were surrounded by those who opposed us. So you can see that we were not preaching with deceit or impure purposes or trickery. For we speak as messengers who have been approved by God to be entrusted with the good news. Our purpose is to please God, not people. He is the one who examines the motives of our hearts. The one did, never one did we try to win with flattery, as you very well know. And God is our witness that we were not pretending to be your friends so you would give us money. It was the purpose that God had. The purpose of to look at whatever your situation would go in. Whether Paul preached for three days, he said, I've been entrusted by God to do something. It was very important that Paul communicated to the early church. Although people may tell you you're a failure, people may not like what you do, if we're doing it for the cause of Christ, it will be successful. So when you look at failure and you look at your failures, whether it's in business or maybe it's you've, you, you've had a, a failed marriage or maybe your kids have done something stupid and you feel that you have failed in certain areas, you can take those areas of what you perceive as failure, give it back to God and say, God, what are you going to do with my perceived failure? Here's what Satan does in our failures. He takes your worst moment. Maybe it's your worst moment as a parent. Maybe it's the worst fight that you've had with your spouse. Or maybe it's a business decision. He takes that worst moment and he takes a snapshot. And he says, this is you. You're not going to get any better. This is who you are. Satan will take you at your worst. And he'll leave you there and bring into your mind, this is who you are. And we have to know we are not our failures we have been bought by the blood of jesus christ and we have been successful over our failures if we say no to what satan tries to blind us with but many times we take that snapshot from satan and that failure that we're in that fear that we have been captivated in and we look at that snapshot we put that snapshot on our refrigerator which is not a good idea and we look at that and we say, that is who I am. That defines me. And everything that we do is because we believe the lie that Satan, that at our worst, defines who we will ever be. And if that is the case, we have a problem with who we are going to become. So the first point is failure doesn't have to be fatal. Failure does not have to be fatal. Our visit with you was not a failure. Paul was trying to communicate to you. All those old people may be around you in Thessalonica that said your pastor lasted three days. I'm sorry, three weeks. And he preached this message and he left out of town. He packed up and left. He told you that he was going to be there, but he left town. He was a failure and everything that he said was a failure. He was a con. Do not listen to him. Paul is writing back to the church. And he said, listen, when we were there... It was for a purpose, and we preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he wanted to defend himself. Don't listen to all the junk of all the other people. Stay focused. What we were entrusted to you was to preach the gospel, to change people's lives. And people will oppose you as long as you're doing what God wants you to do. There will always be opposition. In Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16, it says, The Bible says, For there a righteous man falls seven times and rises again, but the wicked are brought down in calamity. If we have the ability to trust in God and we do not believe the lies of Satan, we can fall. The righteous man, the one that believes in God, the one that serves after God, if the righteous man will fall seven times, it means you are going to make mistakes. You are going to have junk going into your life. But if you fall, the righteous man will rise up seven times because he has a purpose within his life and he knows what his life is all about. But an unrighteous man, when he falls, he has no purpose to stand. And sometimes they stay just because there's no thing to stand for. You know, Jesus had two men in his camp. One by the name of Peter and the other by the name of Judas. Judas failed Jesus miserably. 
he failed him. But instead of repenting and confessing, he left and committed suicide. Peter also failed Jesus. He stood before his brothers and he says, I will never leave you. And Jesus looked right at him and he said, before the cock would crow three times in the morning, you will have denied me three times. But the difference between Judas and Peter was this. Jesus was broken and he knew he failed. But he repented and was embraced with forgiveness. There's a difference. You will fail. I will fail. But we have to realize that when we fail, Jesus is like our Father that wants to restore us and to give to us hope. Remember that failure isn't final. And it isn't fatal. God can bring you back from any failures within your life. There's nothing that God cannot and will not forgive you for. When we sit in the office and we talk to many t people in counseling, and they say, Pastor, you're not going to believe my story. And I said, you know what? It's not for me to believe. I, I know that there are some awful situations going on in life. But you know what? It's not for me to believe your story. It's for you to be honest before God and accept the forgiveness that God has given to you and work on where you are and let God redeem you from where you are. We have to understand failure doesn't have to be fatal. And then uh, failure can be a fertilizer for success. I love this. Failure can be a fertilizer for success. The Bible says in Thessalonica, Thessalonians, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. Approved by God. Even though we're approved by God doesn't mean that we are not going to have failures in perception. It means that we're going to have issues going within our life. You know, there are a lot of people that the, the people would think that they were failures. Let me give you a few and see if you know who this is. The first one, see if you can guess the names of these successful failures. We fi he was fired from a newspaper for lacking imagination and having no original ideas. Anybody know? Walt Disney. She was demoted from her job as a news anchor because the producer said she wasn't fit for television. Oprah Winfrey. Yeah, of course, I'll leave. That's Oprah. That's Oprah. Okay. At 30 years old, he was devastated and depressed after being removed from a company he started, Steve Jobs. He failed to sixth grade and was defeated in every election for public office until he became England's prime minister, Winston Churchill. <laughs> I like this one. He was fired after his first performance at the Grand Ole Opry. And he was told by the manager, you ain't got anything going on here, son. You got to get back to driving a truck. Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley. And then we just watched the video with Michael Jordan. In 2006, Michael Jordan made a television commercial for Nike in which it stated, I've missed over 9,000 shots. I lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I failed over and over and over again in my life, and that's why I succeed. I tried. In order to be successful, we have to have the courage to stand in the face of opposition. Paul, in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 13, it says, Paul was the original optimist. He turned his lemons into lemonade, he turned a jailhouse into a church house, and he turned those chains into a congregation, and he turned a prison into a pulpit. Although he was beaten, scarred, and chained, he would not quit. He would be considered a failure, a convict. But he was not going to let a title of individuals determine his outcome. He was going to let the failure of people's perception be the fertilizer in order to give an opportunity to share the gospel or to do what God has called him to do. The third thing, the formula for failure is the, f the formula for failure is to try to please everyone. The formula of, of failure is to try to please everyone. In the scripture we just read, we are not trying to please men, but God. We're not trying to please men, but God. Herbert B. Swope, in his first winner of the Pulitzer Prize for reporting, he later stated in his article in the New York World Times, his most famous quote is, I cannot give you the formula for success, but I can give you the formula for failure, which is this. Try to please everyone. Try to please everyone. If you spend your life trying to please people, you will never succeed. We have one goal, and that's to please God. 
God has entrusted us with a life, with a plan, with his will. And we cannot be deterred because people want us to do something different. We have to be focused on what does God have for us. Abraham Lincoln is created by saying, you can fool some of the people all the time, but all the people some of the time, but you cannot fool all the people all of the time. You can fake it for a little while. But you know what? To be genuinely real, you have to be real. If you please God, it doesn't matter whom you displease. But if you please God, it doesn't matter whom you please. Because when you please God, things will always work out. People will always have opinions. People will always think you should do something better or not do something better. There was a father and a son in ancient times that, was, that had a donkey, and they were traveling to a far city. And they went to different towns. And the first town, the old man was on the donkey. He was just walking on the donkey, walking the donkey, and the old man was up. So he said, and the people in the city said, Old man, why are you, why are you making the little kid walk? Why don't, why don't you let him ride the donkey? So he said, okay. So they, the old man got off the donkey. He put the kid on the donkey, and the old man was walking beside the donkey. They went to the next town. And the next people said, why, why, old man, are you letting the kid ride the donkey? You're old and feeble. You should be on the donkey. So they said, oh, we can't please anybody. So they both got on the donkey. They both got on the donkey, and then they went to the, the, the next town, and the people said, that poor donkey. What, why are, you're going to kill that poor donkey. So they got off. So they were short distance. So they were carrying the donkey to the next town. So they walked on a bridge, and they were carrying the donkey, and the donkey fell off and drowned. They were sad. But there was a moral to the story. Is this, if you try to please everybody, you're going to lose your assurance of success. Okay? And you can't lose your assurance of success by trying to please everybody. You have to do what you're called to do and deter yourself from pleasing people. Now, please God. And if people stand for God and give you the encouragement because you're doing what God wants you to do, that's fine. But when you're trying to look at and worrying about what everybody thinks about every different thing, about what you're going to do, and if somebody doesn't like what you're doing for the cause of Christ and they try to deter you from doing it, you have to say, get thee behind me, Satan. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. I am not going to fail because I have to please you. I'm going to succeed because I want to please God. That is paramount when we're looking at what God wants to do within our life. And God uses our failures to test us. God uses our failures to test us. Oh, life is full of tests, isn't it? Tests. Starts in school. And then when you get to be my age, it comes medical tests, blood tests, blood pressure tests, everything. There's always a test. Every place you go, there's a test. At work, there's a test. But when we're looking at physical tests or we're looking at educational tests, those are very finite. You can see success or you can see failure because there's an A, B, C, D, or an F. There's no E, but it goes right to F. But those tests are very finite. You can see the truth. In our spiritual tests, those are a little bit more tricky. Because when God tests us, he doesn't test the outward appearance. He tests the conviction of our soul. He sees who we truly are. And sometimes when God tests us, he refines us. He wants to see the purity come to the top. He wants to see why. He wants to see what you're made of. He wants to see if I give you this test and you come through this test and I can give you some responsibility, some authority, some help down the road because you went through the refinery process, you have been refined and came out clean. That's the test that we all go through. And those tests are difficult. A survey was said, when is the the closest time that you've ever been to God. And it's not the time that everything's great. It's not the time that your kids are doing great and you're making a lot of money. It's not the time your health is wonderful. The time that you're closest to God is the time you have issues within your life, calamities within your life, things that are falling apart. That is when we get a hold of God because we've been fought in the fire and been tested and we find out that oh, we need God. 
We don't necessarily need God during the great days, but we do need him during the testing days. Paul understood this temporary failure was a test, and he wrote, God who tests our hearts. Paul could have very easily said, you know what? This preaching gig, it's not working out for me. I'm getting tired of being beaten. I'm tired of spending more nights in a prison than I do in a hotel. I'm getting tired of being laughed at and mocked at. I'm getting tired. I don't think I am cut out for this gig. But he says, no. I have been entrusted with the gospel to proclaim the message of Jesus Christ. And when we are entrusted with our life to do God's will, we have to understand there will be testing that comes our way. And if those testings comes our way, will we be faithful in those tests? Because we all have them. The only way that we will fail a test from God is if we have an impure heart and we try to honor ourselves instead of honor God. But when we go through those calamities, we go through those issues, and we say, Lord, I don't know what to do. I'm struggling. I am hurting. These issues are overwhelming to me. That's when he says, come to me. Trust in me. You know, the purpose of Glenville is twofold. The purpose of Glenville is to grow a church, granted. The bigger purpose of Glenville is to build the people within the church. So when calamities take place or when issues take place, what do we do? Are we afraid of what's taking place? The growth of the person within the church is this. When things do happen, you know where to go. When life does throw you a curveball, you know what to do. You get on your face before God. And you say, Lord, I need you to teach me what you need me to do. I'm struggling. I'm hurting. I'm fearful. I feel personally like I'm a failure. And God does the supernatural. The test that's deep within your soul, he fixes us. He helps us. Just because people's perception is one thing doesn't mean reality is that thing. Um, there's a, a new poll out, and I'm going to be political here for a second, just funny politically, but um, there's a new poll out for the president's approval rating. Okay? And uh, <laughs> uh, do you know, do you know who has the highest ever recorded since Gallup poll started the president tracking in 1937? Do you know who has the number one highest political presidency, political uh, polling rate, do you know who that would be? George W. Bush. Well, he's considered a failure as a president. Yeah, but the week after 9-11, he was the best president in the world. But you know what? He also has the 72% disapproval rating just four years later. How fickle we become. But you know what? When you look at the entire political landscape, President George Bush, over his eight-year tenure, has a 49.9% average political rating. Barack Obama is 49%, so George is still 0.9% better. Of course. You know who would they consider to be probably the least favorite president ever? Harry S. Truman. Harry S. Truman. Harry S. Truman had to make some decisions when he was president that the world and his cabinet, and even people in the United States thought he was crazy. He did some things that, um, that we wouldn't necessarily like. He had to make some decisions on some bombs, on, the, on his commander on the field in the presidency, MacArthur. But he did something on May 14th, 1948. Israel declared itself a state. And his cabinet said, don't back it. Twelve minutes after Israel decided that they are going to be a state, the president's spokesperson came out and he said this. President Truman's press, press secretary issued this statement. The president has been informed that the Jewish state has been proclaimed in Palestine. The United States recognizes this provisional government as the de facto authority of the new state of Israel. The first nation recognized Israel as a state was the United States. One day later, 
On May 15th, the Arab armies attacked Israel on the very first war of Israel and the Arab nations. But at least Israel had one country as their ally. And who is that country? United States. Harry S. Truman has been, his reputation as being the most unpopular president ever. Many would call him a failure. He didn't care about people's opinion. He was afraid of what, he was not afraid to fail. He said, the buck stops here. When asked about this unpopular decision, he said this. What if Moses would have taken a poll? Would he have gotten it? What if Jesus Christ would have preached and taken a poll of Israel? What would have happened if the Martin Luther um, would have taken a poll at the Reformation? Polls or public opinions doesn't make things right or doesn't make it wrong. What makes it right is the poll of God. When we know what God wants us to do, we do not have to lick our fingers and put our finger in the air to see which way the wind is blowing. What we have to do is take a look at the Word of God and say, what does God want me to do? Whether you agree with the president, whether you don't agree with the president, whether you agree something politically or whether you don't agree with something with the, with, with the views of others, we as the believers of Jesus Christ, in order to not be a failure and to find favor with God, we have to say this, what does the Bible say? What does God want for us? And if we take with what the Bible says, not what man's opinion is, not what the preacher says, not what a church says, not with what a denomination says, what does the Bible say? And we hold that up to our truth. And we do not go by popular opinion, but we go by Jesus Christ and the Word of God. We will find favor with God. Now, we may fail some things, but failure doesn't define us. People's perception of us doesn't define us your failures of your past do not cripple you you cannot be held into a prison because of stupid things that you used to do here's the deal once you gave your life to christ you have been forgiven you've been liberated satan wants to put that stupid snapshot picture of you and say this is who you are but jesus says throw it away Put it in the fire and say that I have been redeemed. I do make mistakes. The righteous man may fall seven times, but he's going to get back up. That tells me that forgiveness is continual. You may have been terrible in your life. You may have made stupid mistakes. You may have thrown away some things that you would wish you had never thrown away in your life, in your relationships, and maybe even your finances, or maybe even in your occupation. But you cannot be held into that failure. You have to get on your knees before God and say, God, forgive me of that. Do not let the snapshot of the worst time of your life captivate you in bondage for your future. Because I believe the church has a future. And the only way the church will fulfill its future if it gets the people that's been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, to quit looking at their past, at their failures, their handcuffed life, and say, I'm not going to do that anymore. I don't care where I was. I don't care what I did. I don't care about the failures of the past. I know there's one that loves me. I know there's one that forgives me. And I know that if I put my faith and my confidence in him, he's going to forgive my failures. And he's going to turn my failure into favor now i have a question would you rather have the applause of man or the favor of god now a lot of times we would say i like the accolades of man but the accolades of man become very fickle ask president bush 90 percent approval rating he was the man for about a month and how quick it turned you can have your somebody tell you that you do a great job and you're awesome or would you rather, at the end of your life, you hear something? Jesus looks at you, and he says a phrase that will send chills up my spine. When he looks at me face to face, the one that died on the cross for my sins, and he says, well done, that good and faithful servant. 
You didn't try to please man. You pleased me. And he'll say, thank you. I didn't do anything. I just accepted the gift that he gave to me. But because of him, his servanthood, and his forgiveness, he says, thanks. I got your house ready. Just because I want to honor God. I have failed miserably. You have failed miserably. But we have been redeemed miraculously. I'll take God's favor any day. But we have to do this. That snapshot. You know what snapshot I'm talking about. You see it every day. You see what Satan is plant, taking a picture and put it in front of your face every day. You know your worst and your weakest moment. And you live with that every day. The only way that you're going to turn that failure into favor is if you take that snapshot and you give it to God. And you say, God, I need you. I need you to erase that picture. And God has a digital camera. And he can swipe that picture and he can push a button and that, bush, that button says what? Delete. Delete. Done. Gone. Over. And he says, take a new picture. Take a new picture. Take a picture of your success. Take a picture of my favor. Put that on your refrigerator. Put that in your face. And say to yourself, that is who I am. And if we can get away from our failures, just like Paul says, I'm not here to please man. I'm here to please God. I've been entrusted with something more important than what people think. And put my favor in front of my face and say, that is who I am. That is when we will have success. That's when we will have favor with God. And that's when we can go through our life not worrying whether people agree with us or like us or even care about us because we know we have one that loves us. And that one is Jesus. That one is my Savior. That one is the one that died for me. That one name is above every name. That one name changes the world. And when you say the name Jesus, you will offend others. When you say what Jesus Christ did for you, you will make some people mad. But you know what? You put a smile on God's face when you talk about his son. That is favor from God. Let's go to our prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. And we thank you for your love to us. And Lord, our failures that we have had. Lord, we need your forgiveness. And Lord, those things we just lay at your feet. I pray that you will allow that snapshot in our minds of our past to be wiped clean. And Lord, we ask you to forgive us and give to us a new vision, a new purpose, a new picture of what you have in store for us with your favor. Let us open the door of our prison cell and be let go. Give to us the freedom to honor you, to love you, and to experience that forgiveness. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Pastor Alex.